So welcome everyone um, to Podchat Live episode number 75. Um, topic of discussion this evening or this morning for the Aussies is um, running injuries with particular uh, emphasis on, on history taking with, with an injured runner. Utterly delighted to have Thomas DeCanto with us. Thanks for joining us, Tom. Um, super early for you, but um, I know as an and athlete me. and a... Uh, and you, but you, yeah, but you're not human, though. You, Tom's a normal human being. So, as an athlete and as a as a father of a young family, I know that five AM starts probably not alien to you. But thanks for joining us. We 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 were really looking forward to this one. And for those of you who don't know Tom, he is a sports podiatrist at Walker Street Sports Podiatry in Sydney, and he's a runner himself. And when I say he's a runner himself, like this guy's legit. He's the real deal. Um, Two fourteen marathon. I hope I haven't um, sold yeah. you short on your PB there. So yeah. Tom is the kind of guy that when you're around him and he asks, you know, you're asked if you're a runner, you, you should probably say no. That's, that's the way I see it. You know, I, I don't describe myself as a runner around people like Tom or like Nita, for example. But yeah, um, really, really excited to get your, not just your experience of, of treating injured runners, which you do day in, day out, but just a bit of a, a, a step into the mind of a, of a runner as well. Because we know runners are strange, strange humans as well. So the reason we thought this episode one is, uh, this episode was was valid and, and sensible is because we find ourselves in this current scenario where uh, as we know as we keep saying in almost every episode with the global pandemic where lives are changing and whether you depending on whether you're doing a lot more work because you're frontline and you're a proper hero whether you're doing a lot less work like me you just you know at home all the time depending on lots of uh, sort of socioeconomic factors you might find that the the volume of your exercise is changing we know a lot of people are probably doing less training either because they're at work more or or they're exhausted or perhaps there's um, other reasons they can't and therefore at some point when they return to training that jump up from after an hiatus from training we think probably presents a risk for running injury we've got some people that are doing a load more training just because you've got more free time so i know there's some people around here looking for looking at their Stravas that are treating this lockdown like a training camp and um, a sudden spike in training we know is a is a pretty big risk factor for running injury as well and then we need to consider of course there are potential increases in non-mechanical stresses for all of us so our sleep interruption uh, our sleep patterns may be interrupted we may be more stressed more anxious uh, there could be people suffering with other psychological factors like depression all these things can influence injury risk so combine all of this with the fact that if we make the assumption the racing calendar is going ahead as planned, the back end of this year, uh, what is there? There's like five major marathons in like a, every Sunday for like five Sundays in a row or something. Like October, November looks crazy. And I've certainly spoken to some of my, my athletes and patients who had planned to do a spring marathon, whether it be Boston or London or Rome, and they plan to do an autumn one like Chicago or New York. And now they've all been moved together. They're still planning to do them. And they're now two weeks apart. So we just feel this is the perfect storm for runners of all levels, potentially being more likely to get injured. And then throw into that that telehealth and remote consultations has been thrust upon all of us. The history taking with a runner, we feel, has always been the most important. But it's just never been more, never more obviously important than, than with remote and online consultations and telehealth so here we are running injuries uh, and why history taking is, is so important a whole hour just dedicated to history taking why tom why tom takes a history hat the way he does how he takes a history so a couple of questions before we get to what you do in the in the consult a couple of questions that came in if that's okay um first off someone asked how long you assign to see a runner for the first time because the one thing we know about runners is, is these guys and girls can seriously talk yeah um, yeah, that, that's true. That's very true. So I, I set aside uh, an hour for for any sort of injury consult, um, and I'd say I'd say probably the majority of that is is just chatting to the runner. Um, so yeah, an hour essentially I set aside for for that. Yeah, perfect. And do you find you run over? You know, with you, 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 I'm guessing you know with some consultations you may have an hour and you've pretty much got things wrapped up within 35 minutes, but actually with a lot of runners, do you find you get into the hour and they're just, they've just got one or two more questions. You're, you're, you're running over quite a bit. Yeah. 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 That's my experience too. Um, with regards to when they are coming in to see you and you, before they book in via the clinic, by the website, whatever, however you got it working, you send them out some medical history forms and maybe a consent form. Is there anything special that you might send a runner that you wouldn't send another potential patients so any any information anything you want them to bring how do you tee up that that sort of scenario yeah um so 
I'll have a general intake form that'll get uh, emailed to anyone that has uh, booked in. And then on that form, there's a there's like a tick box for anyone that's coming in for a running related injury, running assessment. If they tick that box, they'll get an additional form. And that's the, um, I think we're going to come on to those. It's the, um, I got a, like a, it's a runner evaluation form. So that's, that's the history component. But at the end of that, I've got a bit about um, what, what to bring in. So bring in their runners, bring in some, you know, some clothes that would be suitable for, for an assessment, shorts, tights, that sort of thing. Um, that, yeah, that's pretty much it. And, and previous imaging, if they've got imaging they think's relevant to, to their, their issue, then uh, ask them to bring that as well. Yeah, makes sense. And pre- talking about them bringing in their runners, i.e. their footwear, um, you know, quite a few runners have a, have a range, have a, have a collection. They've got some in rotation. Where do you draw the line? You certainly, I'm guessing, don't want people coming in with 24 pairs. But at the same time, if they come in with one pair and then during the history, it becomes quite clear this is 15% of their training week. You know, what, what, what's, how do you set the scene with regard to footwear? Is there a limit? No, there's no limit. So I'd leave it pretty open. If they want to bring in a bag, that's fine. Um, I don't mind. I don't, I don't mind if they, it, it, it's pretty, normally pretty quick and easy just to have a quick scan of, of their footwear. Um, so yeah, to me, to me, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a big deal. If they want to bring a bag, that's, um, that's totally fine. I do like, it is good, I think, if they want to bring in a pair that they've actually done a bit of running in as opposed to sometimes they'll bring in, they might be embarrassed maybe that they're, they're going to bring in an old crappy pair. So they'll, they would have bought like a brand new pair and it, 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 it's not as ideal, I guess. It's nice to assess um, uh, the running shoes they've been running in. Um, yep. So I, do, I would encourage that, like the runners to bring in the running shoes they have been running in. Yeah, that makes good sense. I've just had a complete thought and I'm just going to put it out there because I don't think anyone's ever said this. Just talk, just had a, a text message from a friend saying that they hadn't, um, they hadn't considered the Corona virus related risk of, in, of running injury. I think we should, what, what do you think about the name ca- calling it something, you know, co- he said COVID-19 overload. I was like, <laughs> we could call this co- Covalode, running Covalode <laughs> injuries. I'm just going to put it out there. I know it's probably a bit shit, but I wanted to be the first person that said it. Running Covalode injuries, you heard it here first. Um, let's talk about your, let's talk about running questionnaires, because I know that we've spoken about this before, uh, Tom, that, that, that one of the first papers we were both made aware of during our training was Kevin Kirby's paper with Ron Valmassi. I think Craig's going to do us a favor and share yeah. it. This was, this was the first paper I recall reading that was, was so specific, not just, to, not just to running injury or just to history taking, but to history taking in a, in a runner. Um, we'll put the link to it in, in the thing down below. How much, um, I know you, you talked about your own um, evaluation form, which we'll see shortly. How much did this influence your form? Yeah, greatly. I think there was about, um, I had about three or four different forms that I, um, were basically just picking the bits that I thought were most relevant. Um, eight years ago when I started private practice and started treating runners. So, um, yeah, but that one certainly was, yeah, it, it's great the way it's set out. Just the rationale for each question is there. Um, and, yeah, so that, that did form a pretty big component. There's some questions in there that I pretty much directly use. Yeah, uh, still. Me too. And I can't remember what year it was. What year is it, Craig? Uh, 80, 80, 1983. 80. Wow. Yeah. 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 Thomas, can I just ask you, you, if I heard you right, you said you'd had a couple of different forms over the, over the years. Yeah. Um, what's changed? What have you added? What have you deleted? Um, less que- like, for example, the last thing I cut out was questions about stretching. Um, yep. More questions <laughs> about training load, training habits, and less questions about um, footwear. Um, uh, what else have I changed? Um, have you got a actually, copy? Have you got a current copy there? We can see. Yeah. yeah. But actually, but that, awesome. that's interesting what you just said then, Thomas, because that's actually very consistent with what, say, the evidence, the data has been showing us over the last 10 years. You know, it's, it's just following nicely along with that trend. Would, um, yeah. That's the, yeah. And that's the exact reason I've done it. Just, I'm just obviously trying to be, um, you know, put aside any bias. You know, I love talking about running shoes. I love running shoes, but... <laughs> Um, yeah, you know, I got to, I got to try and be as evidence based as possible. So, um, trying not to, uh, get, yeah, bogged down with stuff that may not be that important. Talking about that and talking about stretching, because we know that runners often, 
whether we think we consider them important from an evidence point of view, we know runners do things because they like to, or because they believe they should be doing, or because habitually they always have. Uh, do you stretch despite what you know about the evidence? I, I, I used to stretch like in my junior days when I used to, when I started running when I was 15 or 16, I'd, I'd spend probably like half an hour a day stretching because I, just because I thought that was what you had to do. Um, these days I hardly ever stretch. Like I, I could go a week without stretching. Um, so I used to stretch because not because I felt like I needed to, because I thought I should. Um, and that, that's what I guess. Yeah. It, it, it's yeah. So it's, it's a bit of an eye opener. Like I, I um, you shouldn't, I guess you shouldn't really be stretching unless you feel like you actually need to. And if you don't feel like you need to, no one should really tell you, um, that you should be. Yeah. Um, that's how I feel anyway. I think it's a bit like, you know, whether it be stretching, whether it be foam rolling, um, you know, I, I generally tend to say to runners, like, do it if you want to do, do it because you want to, but, but know that you don't, you know, do it because you want to, not because you need to, so to speak. Like, don't, I'm not going to tell you to stop doing it if you like doing it for whatever psychological reason but know that it's probably not the big win yeah. so um I, I actually have i have a question in in my form that's um I, I ask people if they if they regularly get massage or if they regularly are using a foam roller um and if they tick, tick yes in the consult i'll ask them you know the, the reason they do it and if it's just because they've been told to do it versus because they actually feel if someone tells me um I'm always tight. I always feel like I need to roll out. My muscles are always sore. That's, that's a warning sign for me. I need to delve deeper, deeper into their training loads because mm -hmm. to me, that's not normal. Like a lot of people feel, feel like oh, I run, so I'm always sore. And, and for a novice runner, that might be true for a while, but um, people that are constantly feeling like they need to, to roll out, I feel like maybe they're, they're doing something, in their, in, something to do with their training habits that aren't quite right. Actually, yeah, though, that's good those, one. So, so th those that are foam rolling, we, when you sort of try to delve a little bit deeper, why are they doing it? Because they read it on Runner's World, or they were told by a health professional, or, or what, what sort of? Because I actually find that interesting. Because I actually try to sort of almost you're trying to get into their psyche a wee bit as to sort of where are they getting their information from, because that might yeah. influence what advice I give them down the track when I get to it. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of runners are, are doing it because they probably because they feel they feel tight all the time. Like I see a lot of runners that are they're training for ultras or they're training for really long distance events and um, they actually do feel like they're always sore. So they're rolling for that. I think a, a lot of the time for that reason, as opposed to stretching, um, they're still and that's probably more the the maybe the newer runners. They're stretching just because they think they should. There's still some, there's still, I guess, a thought process out there. A lot of people think that um, they need to be stretching just for preventative reasons. Um, and then, yeah, so if, they, if that's the reason they're saying it, then, you know, I, I'm not going to tell them that they, they're, you know, they need to keep doing it if they don't necessarily need to keep doing it, if that makes sense. Craig, you know, a lot of them just do it when I ask them. Uh, I'll mm -hmm. always, because if someone does something, I'll always ask them about their beliefs. They just, they do it and you ask them why and they say, because it feels good. Mm -hmm. you know, difficult, difficult point to, to counter. If it feels good oh, and it's yeah. not taking away time from other things you should be doing as well. If you're yeah. just doing it as a bonus, if, if it's time you'd normally be sitting on the sofa watching Netflix and you're sitting on the floor rolling watching Netflix, I'm, I'm kind of cool with that. I've got no problem with that. Tom, so mm -hmm. let's get into the really cool stuff because, you know, some of these questions about asking runners about their beliefs is kind of what I nerdily find kind of exciting. So let's talk through um, whether you want to talk through your form and share it or whether you just want to talk through it uh, yourself. But what does, a, what does a consultation with you look like? Is it, does it take a fairly s sort of systematic order? Do you work through things systematically or does it depend on the, the context of what, what's in front of you? Uh, well, yeah, so I, I kind of, um, when you asked me to come on, I had to think about how I actually do it because it, it's so automatic. Um, but when I thought about it, the way, the way I sort of approach um, history with runners is, is a two, kind of like a two-step or, or two, um, two components to it. So it's, it's the so breadth and depth of history taking is sort of the two sort of areas I'm, I'm looking at. So the, um, the, the breadth, uh, the, the broad sort of history is, is that runner evaluation form. So that's, that's what I will send out prior to the consultation. Ideally, they'll fill that out, send that to me. 
and I'll have a quick read of it before they come in. Um, and then the way, I guess, from a practical sense, then when they're in, I'll, you know, I don't just jump straight to going through that form with them. I'll, um, I'll ask a pretty open question. So it'll be something like, um, you know, what, what's brought you in here today? Um, I used to say... I used to say something like, how, how can I help you? But I used to get, um, a lot of the runners would look at me funny saying, I, I don't really know, but I'm here because of this. Um, so now I just go straight to, you know, what's brought you in. Um, and then, like, as you said, runners can talk. So, you know, they can give a pretty good history themselves sometimes without any probing at all. So, um, you know, it could be 10 minutes, could be 15 minutes. And um, I really try not to interrupt them. They can just, you know, talk for as long as they want. Um, and that's where the, the, the second part of my history taking will, will, will kick in. It'll be more of like a focused approach then. So I've got the, the, the runner evaluation form with me there that they filled out. They just told me why they're in verbally. Um, and, and then, yeah, then, then I'll just start, start up that line of questioning and it, it'll normally, um, it'll normally start with, with diagnosis. So my goal really is with that, that focused approach of history then to, to get a diagnosis just through through history through getting them they can point to the area so essentially show me where where the pain is and then i'll talk i'll ask some questions about that and my goal is to have a provisional diagnosis before i even put my hands on them and the, the point of the physical assessment will then just be checking for um or just confirming or, or ruling out diagnoses i guess um and then from there it, it would just be questioning um more about all around the risk factors. So I would have identified. So again, from that runner evaluation form, they may have ticked some boxes or written some things and it's already like sort of um, set alarm bells or, or, you know, I'm interested in those areas. So I'll, I'll then can delve deeper into those, those sort of areas. So ask some questions um, about, get more information about that to see if they really are actually um, contributing factors to, to why they're injured. Um, yeah. And then, so yeah, just from, from there it would, it probably more go into any sort of physical um, component of the exam. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Can we see your? Can we? Have you got the form? Can we see it? Have you got an electronic version you can share? Yeah, let me figure out this. Well, you'll, you'll send it through to me, and I'll put it up. Yeah. There's the green share button at the bottom of the little Zoom box there. I will do it. I'll get there. Just while you're doing that, just share a comment that Matt Phillips made, but just referring back to our foam rolling where some people just see foam rolling as a cheaper or indeed a free version of getting a massage. So just again, um, probably a solid point there as well. Okay, here we go. Here we go. So this is what you send them um, before, before they've seen you so they book in to yeah. see you and this is emailed to them and they fill this out and they bring this with them or they email it before they've attended it's i actually have this is old school i actually have like a an online form now oh, cool. so i don't really use this one anymore but yeah Great. so it'll, it's so, actually quite good so it's, it's an online form so it it and it links with my pms so they'll get an email they'll fill it out online and it'll be uploaded straight to their patient file Perfect. So what have we got here? We've got how long have you been running? So that's get, getting, a, I guess, getting a bit of a feel for their, you know, are they a novice? Are they, are they, you know, their past exercise history, you know, their, their chronic load, so to speak. Um, it's, yeah, yeah it's the first remember. 11 questions are, are, are pretty much training history. So the three main components would be, um, yeah. what's that, Craig? It's, it's interesting. Like, I, if, I, if I could look back, you know, to when I first started and, and treating runners, um, the question there would be how many miles or kilometers a week do you do? And that was pretty much it. Yeah. It's like the, the concept of, you know, the longest run of the week. Um, and then even how many, how many would you like to be running per week? How many are you like, it's, it's, it's interesting how the, the whole load understanding that training has, has just, you know, as the years have gone by, you know, and it really was how many miles a week did you do is literally what we used to ask. And then you just moved on to the next question and didn't really um, spend a lot of time on it. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I suspect a lot of people, they may, that may still be the, the beginning and end of a running mm. sort of history taking. And this is why I wanted people to see this because you just look at the detail here. Question two is a great question, by the way. Uh, yeah. What are you doing? Are you coached? Are you following 
you know, a, a program from a, a website, a magazine, or do your own thing. I love that. That's a great, great little box. Yeah. Do your own thing with a novice runner. That's, that's, you know, you got to delve <laughs> deeper there for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, talk us through it uh, from from then. So you, you're getting their question three. You're asking them for their volume, and are you are you taking them at their word? Are you are you demanding that you see their Strava or their, um, you know, are you? Um, how far do you go there? No. I'll, I'll generally take them by their word. Um, my <laughs> Strava is handy. I, we can I can use Strava, um, uh, you know, to monitor training loads or or to assess training loads. But no, they you know I'm happy for them just to give me. Their, 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 their mileage yeah perfect um, so yeah this is brilliant so, so yeah so um actually on this as well like it, it's a it's four pages it's pretty long but it's actually quite interesting when it, when i used to do these paper forms um runners actually quite i think they quite enjoy filling it out because not only will they be filling the following the lines but often they'd be like you know they'd be chucking in like every single white bit of space would be filled with writing so um you know it's long but you know a lot of runners actually appreciate the fact that you're you're trying to go into some depth and that you're trying to get you know really good history and and you know at the end of the day it's it's to it's to get better outcomes for them yeah. so a lot another, of them actually appreciate another interesting point there is the question you've got there about the number of runs per week which again going back a long time ago i would never have considered it was all miles per week but one thing I find quite interesting, I, I occasionally delve into um, a, a few runner support groups on Facebook and you occasionally see the que question, you know, like it might be the Berlin Marathon group, which I'm part of at the moment. You know, and someone might ask a question, oh, how many days a week are you guys training? And it really surprises me how many people are training for the Berlin Marathon only running three days a week or four days a week that they, you know, so, so the question is really getting at how much rest do you have? And, and, and that's something, yeah. again, historically would never really considered that they, you know, when I used to run competitively, a, a rest day was we only trained once that day. Um, I'm surprised how many elites have days off. <laughs> and I, I oh, Pete Larson's book uh, on running shoes, he had a chapter in there on injuries. And, and the, the first paragraph in that chapter said the best way to prevent an injury was to have one day a week off. And I thought, really <laughs> you know like so it's, it, i think that that how many days a week you run so actually is it's becoming more and more important yeah and uh, if that you know you can you can figure out with that with the information there with the the the, the total mileage the number of run, runs per week and the longest weekly run you can figure out like how they organize their training like how they would break it up so if you've got the whole yeah. volume and say if they do, say, if, you know, some runners, 80% of their weekly volume will be in one run. It might be that weekly long run. And so, you know, and if they're, they're injured, that might be something you need to tweak. So they need to maybe break it up a little bit more potentially. Yeah. Uh, uh, and question eight, Tom, question eight, Tom, I'm, I'm making an assumption. Just what you're getting at here is looking at how, what sort of approach to training they have, whether they're just balls out every run or whether they're taking a more polarized 80, 20 uh, approach. And, and um, is, is my assumption correct? If you if you get this first page before you've even seen them, before you've even um, sort of assessed them, you know, done the actual sort of uh, physical exam, you look at this page and for some people you just say, we should probably change a lot of stuff here straight off the bat. Oh, definitely. Yeah. So <clears throat> this this page, of the training stuff, you know, this is the, you'll see later on the form, so there's, this, the training stuff is the stress. So we're just looking to see how they're stressing their bodies, in what way. And then, um, you know, the, the, that's probably the most important thing, like the running load, the running volume, how they organize their running, the intensities and, and, and the volumes. Um, and then, you know, later on, you know, there's questions about um, recovery, adaptation. So, you know, things like stress, sleep, um, the diet, dietary changes, stuff like that. So they're the main things that, that I'm looking at in this form. Uh, there's, there's other stuff, but the main things is, is the stress and, and the recovery and, and how they, you know, some runners maybe to me, this stuff might looking be looking all good. Um, but then when I get down later in the form, you know, they've been getting, you know, less sleep. And so although their training load hasn't changed and they're confused as to why they're injured, um, they're, they haven't been recovering and they haven't realized they haven't been, or haven't consciously realized they've been, um, their recovery has been affected. Um, yeah. So this, yeah. this, yeah. And what I love about this first page is you've got ten questions here, which isn't isn't an intimidating amount of questions, and 
they're just so nicely worded that essentially in 10 questions you've got from a running perspective where they've been historically where they are right now and then with question 10 what you bring in is where they want to be uh, and yeah. i think that's just that's just the perfect sort of way to set it up just while i ask just before it disappears off my screen matt phillips just asked the question um has your has your form this pre-form have you tweaked it or changed it um given the current climate given that consultations are now online and also i would add my own question into that also being if we take training that may may have changed in the last three weeks you know we're, i'm going to say it again just to hope in the hope that it's this running coverload injury stuff um is there a is there a question further down here which says you know has, has your training changed since lockdown <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Get, get that added. Um, right, let's 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 work our way down the form. Let's go. Um, what have we? What else have we got? So, so there was one more question there, but yeah, that's it. Um, so what then, was there? what was? Oh, was just there just there? I want to I want to know you know their level of comp, you know if, if oh. they're a lead or recreation or just you know it, it may affect treatment uh, essentially um, level of commitment that sort of thing. Um, so then a small section on other activities this used to be this is the one section that used to be quite longer and it's i've condensed it a bit so i just want to know about other other load um or other things they're doing so you know sport other sports and cross training is going to be another stress so it, it, you know a lot especially like adolescents a lot of runners that um are also playing a lot of other school sport i want to know about all that all that other load that could be contributing to their injury although they might have got injured running um, you know, all the accumulative load from other sports. I want to know about that. Um, strength training. So if they're doing it or not, that, that's, a, that's an important question for me. Uh, and like I said, if, if, if they say they're getting a regular massage because they're always feeling they've got a particular muscle group as well, that, that can give me like a location based um, area that I know is getting maybe a little bit too much load. Um, that's interesting. That's good information for me. If, if, they're, if they're telling me they always feel tired, they always feel like they need to release their, their glutes, for example, like, so they're loading proximally. Is that something to do with their technique? Is that something to do with just general volume uh, as opposed to calves? And my calves always, am I always rolling my calves? I think maybe they're doing too many intervals. Um, yeah. So, um, nice. nice. That's that. And then, just jump in, yeah. Obviously, just ask me any if you have any comments or questions along the way. Will do. Um, so, running shoe and orthotic history. So, yeah. So, um, I want to know a bit about their what what running shoes they're running in, um, training and racing. So, a lot of runners will have multiple ones they're training in, multiple ones they might be racing in for different distances. Um, I want to know about yeah the different ones because that yeah that that will come into it like as well as once I'm in the biomechanical assessment as well. Um, I'd like to know um, what they're in. Um, did, yeah, so did you self-select, question three, did you self-select running shoes or did you get a fitting service? So I asked that because, I, so I find there's just two components to getting the right shoe and it's, it's fit and function. So it should be pretty, it, the first thing fit, it should be basic, right? So, you know, you just gotta get the right fitting shoe. It's amazing how many runners are in the, a shoe that's too small. Too narrow or too small? It's really common. So I used to, like now, I routinely get every runner that comes in with their running shoes, put the shoe on, stand up, and I just check the size because it's ridiculous how many how many people have a shoe that's too small. Um, and if particularly with four foot pathology, and you know, I think if I've heard you talk about it, and like if they've got a four foot pathology and they've got a shoe that's too narrow or too short, it's definitely not going to be helping. Um, yeah. So yeah. So, yeah, so I always assess that and, and you know, if, if they're getting it if they're getting it fitted, they're going to a run specialty store, you know, I'm much you get I'm mean, more confident in thinking that they've probably got at least the fit right. Um, the function still may not be quite there, but at least yeah, at least they're getting they're going somewhere to, to help with, with the right size. Um, yeah, so that's I think that's pretty important. And just bringing uh, just interrupting you and bringing in people asking you know, how can we do these biomechanical assessments how can we do sports podiatry you know remotely or online i think this is a great example here of how you can just imagine how these first 15 questions have been filled out and if you're looking at a novice runner with really poor training habits doing no strength work who self-selected their shoes at random um 
I mean, obviously the, the, the pathology will be contextual, but you've, you've, you've straight away got three or four things to change. You don't even need to do a physical assessment just yet. It's like, yeah. you know what, yeah. you know what, let's change your shoes or let's, let's check you're in the right shoes somehow. Let's talk to you about your training habits and then let's catch up again in 14 days. You know, let's do a zoom call in 14 days and see, see if that forefoot still goes a bit numb or, you know, whatever it may be. So uh, there's just so much you can do before you've actually got your hands on people, isn't there? Yeah. It, yeah. Like, I'm, I'm certainly not uh, a, a um, experienced in telehealth at all, but from the ones that I've done, it's, it, it's, it's really just highlighted the fact that you can get, you, you can identify so many issues just via history um, without doing any, without looking at their foot, without looking at um, the way they run, um, just from training habits and um, other things that will be like in the form, like, yeah, their, their, their recovery sort of stuff as well. Yeah. And I think this is a good thing for our history taking long term, because in our episode where we did the online consultations, one of the comments made was don't don't focus or worry about the things you can't do in telehealth. Focus on the things that you can do. Um, and these are the things that, that, that can now take more more front, you know, center stage compared to the getting someone in and putting them straight on the treadmill just because we've got got the treadmill there. So hopefully, yeah. um, you know, post you know when the world stops being on fire we all just we're all just better history takers just because we've, we've had more practice at it um yeah. great so um we're, we're, we're on to the, the golden goose the orthoses <laughs> the, the orthoses uh, discussion which obviously is always sensible to have isn't it um talk us through your your rationale for sort of uh, or how much information you want about their their current or previous uh, foot orthoses use um yes yeah, so obviously i want to know if they're wearing them um and if they are so i've got um when they first start wearing them i think that's relevant particularly because you know sometimes i get people in that um they've been wearing so they've been wearing a custom orthotic since they were eight um and they wore it you know through adolescence they wore it till they were sort of 18 maybe so 10 years and they, they wore it school sport everything all the time um that may affect my recommendation of orthotic use in the future. Um, you know, if, if they grew up with a device, an orthotic, they, they may be more likely to, I feel like they may be more likely to, to benefit, it, benefit from it in the future if other things align and it, it makes sense, obviously, um, as opposed to someone that's just popped one in recently um, or been recommended, you know, in recent years to, to wear it. Um, oh yeah, and, and so with, with the what effect do they have that might tie in with that. So if they tell me, um, you know, I've had this many times, um, if they tell me they wear it because it realigns my, my mm -hmm. limb or, or, you know, it, 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 it I still get it. Um, then I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be really looking into to see if they really need it because if that's the reason they think that they have it and they should have it to realign something, um, yeah, they may not need it as opposed to if they're telling me, you know, it's, it's meant that they can run injury free for the first time in, in years, you know, that it, it's, that's a more relevant reason to obviously use, be using an orthotic. Um, I, lo I love that question. What effect do they have? Cause you're essentially asking them what they, it's their what belief system. What, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Oh. What, what are you, what are your beliefs associated with these devices? That's just yeah. such an important thing to ask people. I think, oh, yeah, I love, I love, they, I love that question. You get a lot of variety, a lot of variety in answers there. And yeah. a lot of the time I get, I don't know. I get, I don't know a lot that <laughs> a lot of runners <laughs> like, I don't know. I don't, they just told me to wear it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I think, but that's so crucial, and, and this is a really important part of it. Even with the footwear as well, is is getting into their belief system. Where are they getting their information from? You know, how strong are those beliefs that they have? And and I, I, like at this stage of, of of it, I'm starting to formulate that. That's going to have a huge influence in, on how I make my recommendations down the track. Like in some mm. people, I'll make a recommendation one way. I might I might make the same recommendation another way, based on their belief systems from from sort of probing a little bit deeper about about what they believe and again i, I you know run, runners read a lot they read runners world they they google stuff they they know a lot about this they may not necessarily like have the critical thinking skills to work out which is correct and which is not correct and which really applies to them or not but they do read a lot and they have the quite strong beliefs on some of them mm. yeah they do yeah, and we've talked before about things like, you know, confronting beliefs, the backfire effects. I think it's super important. It does definitely dictate the way, the language you use from that point forward, doesn't it? Um, 
I can't help but see the next question where you're asking people if they're currently injured. And I'm conscious that we said this was a history taking for the injured runner. But I do want to ask you, uh, how, many, how many uninjured runners do you see? I'm guessing, because you are a proper athlete, runners seek you out. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I'm going to make the assumption that you, I know you don't need to be a runner to be a good podiatrist. We know this. But runners like seeing other people that run. And when they say, well, this guy's a good podiatrist, by the way, he's got a 214. I'm guessing they're choosing you over, over an absolute um, plodder like me or Craig. So talk me through, I guess, there's two questions there, isn't there? Firstly, are uninjured runners coming to see you? And if so, is it just because you're a fast runner and they want to be fast too? <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> it's only a small percentage. I'd probably get, um, I don't know, it might be like one, one or two out of ten. Um, if that, well, yeah, maybe one out of ten that are coming in that aren't actually injured. They just want to. Um, they want to be. Uh, yeah, I guess prevention. <laughs> just, just prevent <laughs> injury prevention, or, or um, a lot of them just want to know. Actually, I get a lot of people coming in. Just want to make sure they're in the right running shoes. They know that I think because they know that I like. I love running shoes, right? I, I'm, I'm a bit of a shoe geek. Like probably like you, you guys are pretty. I know you're into your shoes as well. Um, so they just want to come in and chat shoes. I think a lot of the yeah. time. Um, yeah, and I'm happy to do that. Yeah, get paid to chat shoes all day. Yeah. Um, perfect. So let's assume they're injured for the sake of, you know, the next question, but also the, the kind of theme of this, of this episode. Um, let's talk about, you know, where you go here. I guess what we're getting into here is, is sort of the history of, you know, we've talked about, you know, we've almost covered the past, you know, in, in the previous questions, the past exercise history, the load management, the past orthoses history, if we call it that. We're now getting into the history of the presenter complaint, I'm guessing. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. great. Cool, yeah. great. Take take us through it. Yeah, so yeah, I want to know question two. I want to know um, if you know a lot of runners are coming in with an injury and they're still running, and I want to know if, obviously if they're still running or if they've stopped completely because that'll dictate um, uh, the severity of the injury and 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 the the treatment. So whether we can keep you know ideally we'll keep them running with with their injury and get them better. Um, but yeah, so I want to know if they're if they're running through it or not. Um, uh, sometimes symptoms aren't brought on by running. If they got some information there, I want to know about that. Um, new or recurring, I think that's important as well because, you know, if someone comes in with an, uh, an Achilles issue, I get, a lot of, I get a lot of Achilles issues coming in. So it, it might be that, you know, they, this is the fifth time they've had it. Um, and so that's, you know, that's a problem. We need to delve deeper into why they're getting recurrent issues and so for example for achilles i might then delve deeper into um footwear into yeah biomechanics i might then that know part, part of the you know the assessment looking at that sort of stuff but from a history standpoint maybe as well um training habits so there's someone that, that just does a lot of um intensity or or, or heels um that might be so yeah it's just it's just interesting to see if there's stuff that they're just getting wrong continuously versus a biomechanical thing with, with yep. recurring injury. Um, makes, makes sense. So yeah, durate, we've got duration of symptoms. Um, when they first, when they first notice the pain is, is an interesting one because it gives me a, a bit of a clue on the, the tissue that it might be. For example, if it, if they got it, um, you know, midway through a run versus if they had no pain, um, they went to bed with no pain, but they woke up in the morning with pain. Mm -hmm. uh, it, you know, they're not going to get a calf tear and go to bed without pain, but wake up with pain. They're going to have that pain during the run or, or you know, uh, versus sometimes people have like joint, joint pain or tendon pain, then they won't actually notice it till the next morning. Yeah. Uh, so just trying to tease, actually, out, tease out the kind of mechanical versus inflammatory sort of yeah, components yeah. to it. Yeah. Cool. Ian, I know, I know you love your cuboid syndrome <laughs> and that, that's, that. <laughs> That's one that um that it's odd. Like if it if that's an insidious onset one with the when there's not you know people get that weird lateral pain. Um, I find they generally that's the wake up in the morning um, one. It's odd, but that's kind of I do see that with that one. It's they don't really feel it until the next day. Mm. Um, so ty yeah, ty the type the type of pain um, that'll give me again. It's like an insight into the tissue that it might be, whether it's you know neural joint bone um for the onset 
when does it hurt? So just looking at like sensitivity um, and, and the type of mechanical load. So whether it's stairs or hills, is, does it hurt, only hurt running? That's a good sign. But if it hurts, you know, walking as well or, or at rest, you know, you've got to be more cautious with, with them running on something that hurts at rest, obviously. Um, then, yeah, so 11, again, it's just getting it, it the, the severity of it, but also potentially the tissue. Uh, so like bone versus um, versus soft tissue, they they, they behave differently, obviously. Um, uh, and yeah, you want to know. So just just getting an, an idea on what may relieve or, or or increase their symptoms. So you're already looking at things that yeah they've found that have been helpful or not helpful, which might guide your treatment then. Um, and for question, where, if, question fourteen. That's a cracker. Question fourteen like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah i think i'm just looking at question 15 i think this is the place to add the box for lockdown related training changes yeah. running yeah. running running coverload injury i've said it three times now i want it to stick i want someone in the comments to tell me whether that is genius or whether it's too cheesy to continue saying but um yeah that's probably the place to change a box because you know like we say when we when we really dig into most histories it's the key thing is change isn't it and i love this it's just it's showing people when you say to, to runners sometimes have you changed anything it's a simple question you can ask isn't it has, has anything in your training changed and it's just such a, an easy question for them to say no no i don't think so and then when you look at this i mean there's just there's just eight possible changes here you know which i think really really laying them out for people like this is, is just so important there's loads yeah. of stuff that you do on your form that i'm scribbling down because i thought my form was good until I saw yours. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to need to make some changes in, to, my, to, my, to my own. Um, I've, I've left out some details. So this Actually, is, Thomas, this is great. I might have missed it. I know you had a yeah. question there, running technique. Did, did you ask them on the form about foot strike pattern? Or did I miss it? Um, no, I don't. No, no. So if they tick the box and change running technique in the clinic, I then ask them what they've done. Yeah, no, look, so I, that's I, a super, I, yeah, super, super common one. Um, they've, they've, you know, they're in, they've got a foot injury because they've decided to run on their forefoot. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's common. Yeah, no, I that mean, box was, gets, that box gets some use, I bet, doesn't it? Yeah. yeah. But I mean, the reason I asked that question is that 50% of runners misidentify their foot strike pattern anyway. So yeah, it's... <laughs> yeah, I more just want to know if, if, if it's changed. Like, yeah, I don't really care if they're forefoot or rear foot um, so much, if that's just what they do naturally. But um yeah, if they've changed it because they've read something and there's still stuff floating around, it's just ridiculous. There's just still people thinking that um, they're changing for the wrong reasons, changing yeah. their technique uh, yeah, in, that, in ways that, yeah. yeah. But see, that was my point earlier on about their belief systems and where do they get this belief and information from? It's part of delving into that sort of area of things. Yeah, yeah. yeah we're saying, saying that word a lot, belief, and I think it can't be overstated, can it? Knowing when you've got an injured runner in front of you that, knowing that just that that's a really important thing to get to the bottom of you know so many people when a, when a runner comes in it's like what part of this runner's body or anatomy is injured and uh, i think the real take home here is it's got a, a running injury history taking should be so much broader than that yeah on that note Ian, that's uh, the number 19 there that's again a relatively more recent one that i added Oh, I love it. Yeah, um, I think, yeah, yeah. I think that's super important because again, it's 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 just what they believe, and and that's so important. Like if if they believe they've got, and a lot of them do have, they think like footwear, for example. Oh, it's actually you know that there's that paper on that, right? The 2014 on on their beliefs around that, like 95 runners. They ask them what why they think um, what causes running injuries, and 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 most of them were saying things like footwear not stretching enough. Yeah. Um, and I get that a lot as well. So I want to know if that's what they think, then it may be the case. Maybe it is a sudden change in footwear and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a large change in that the footwear characteristic and it, it could have led to an injury. But, um, you know, if I then assess things, I think, well, no, I, I've just identified that you've just done something ridiculous with your training. That's much more likely to be the cause. I don't, yeah. no, I don't, don't say it like that to them. But, um, you know, I'll word <laughs> it in a way. I'll, I'll, address, I'll address their concerns and say, well, this is probably why it – Footwear may have contributed, but I've just noticed that, um, you know, you've done this, this, and this, and that's probably much more likely to be a contributing factor to why you're injured. And so if they leave and I've, I've at least directly addressed their concerns or the, the reasons they think, I think they're going to leave feeling a bit um, more confident in the treatment because at least I've directly addressed, you know, why they, they, they already have an idea of 
I mean, most of them have an idea of why they're injured. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a that's a cracker. Nineteen, love it. Great. Um, we're on bottom of page three. We've got two more pages to go. Um, this is uh, brilliant, and, yeah. and this this is important. This is people. To, yeah. Anyway, anyone watching who perhaps doesn't see that many runners in clinic thinks, God, this is a bit over the top. This this is not over the top. This is exactly yeah. exactly what a runner requires. Um, so yeah, and it, it, it you know the, the great thing about it as well is that this is done um, outside of the consult. So you're not eating up your consultation time, which is, is just a problem that I think, you know, almost every clinician will have is, is just time constraints. So time constraints, not only asking these questions, but also like note taking. So you've, mm. you've straight away, if they fill this out, you've got, you've got this awesome resource of, of information that's noted. And so you're going to, like I save a lot of time with, with note taking and, and writing notes after the consultation as well, because it's just filling in the gaps and the extra more focused questions that I'll ask that I'm actually just writing, but I've got this as um, you know, on their notes for, for the, for the initial consult, but then also as a reference point when they're coming back down, inevitably, you know, being, being a runner, they'll get injured again, no doubt. Um, hopefully not with, <laughs> yeah. with some of the advice we're going to give, but um, yeah, so it's it's great to have this on file. Yeah, and you can just decide, um, I guess, before, when you're reading it beforehand, you can just decide in that hour that you've got with them face to face where you're going to deep dive two or three yeah, places. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's great. really you just you just then decide where you're going to you know what areas you're going to focus on. So it just preps you for for making sure you're time efficient in the consult and just really getting to those areas you think you should. Cool. Um, Yep. And we're getting into what looks like a previous, previous running injury, which we know is a yeah, risk, so, always a risk factor. Yep. Great. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, if, if, if there's, yeah, in terms of risk factors, previous injury, obviously. So, you know, a big one, like for example, stress fractures, if, if, if they tell me, oh, this is the fourth stress fracture they've had, um, uh, you know, I need to do a deep dive into, into reasons their bone health is not, not great, obviously. Um, if it is a biomechanical, is it, is it, you know, diet related? Is it, you know, um, so yeah. And I also, with this one as well, it, I, I like to in it's sort of like a, a injury profile of runner. So in terms of like location of injury, so some runners tend to have, um, a, a cluster of all their injuries at certain body regions. So they might have, they might be really prone to knee. Uh, more proximal type injuries like knee or hip issues um, or, you know, more likely being, you know, a podiatrist. I'm going to be seeing people that may have um, a long list of foot and ankle injuries. Um, and then I, I want to you know, delve deeper into that. So if they, you know, if, if there's a, a region, I guess I'll use myself as, a, as, a, as an example. So I've, I've probably had about, I don't know, 20, let's say 20 injuries in, in the past 15 years. I'd say 18 of those have been below the ankle, ankle and below. Um, so, you know, this obviously I've got my rationale for why I, I have that, but, you know, I want to delve deeper into, you know, why a runner might be having a region problem. So, um, you know, is it, is it technique? Is it a technique thing? Is it, is it, um, is it biomechanical? Uh, or is it their training habits? Um, are they just doing, are they runners that just do high volume, slow runs, and, and maybe that's why they're getting knee, you know, always getting knee issues or, or is it a runner that, that um, just does, you know, three interval sessions a week and, and nothing else, um, you know, that's probably why they're getting more foot and ankle uh, issues. Um, so, yeah, so I like to, yeah, this is, I really think this is important, the previous injury, because you can kind of profile, um, yeah, profile the runner to some extent sometimes if, if you really, if there's a strong link to, to a region that tends to get overloaded. Yeah, makes sense. Um, and then we're getting into, I guess, past medical history now, are we? The last bit, the last bit. So yeah, it's a bit just a some bit of this, bit of that here, sort of. So yeah, so injury, uh, previous acute. So I want to, yeah, I also want to know about acute injuries. Um, you know, I want to know if they've had a, you know, a grade two or a, like a complete rupture, for example, of a, of a lateral ankle ligament. Because that might maybe the reason why I'm seeing something funny on a biomechanical exam or something like that. So, or it may just be you know if they've got a meniscus injury or, or they've got you know knee OA or something, it may affect my treatment. Like I'm not going to put someone in a you know 
in inverted orthotic if they've got a long history of medial knee OA or something like that. Or be you know really careful with with treating something distal if I've, if they've got something else going on medically or, or previous surgery that sort of stuff. So it, it's just getting that you know getting that overall picture um, and it's a way of not missing things as well. Having this in in the in, in the um, intake form. Uh, yeah, so previous surgery, so weight weight gain or loss, dietary changes, potential unknown eating disorders. So just like it's, I just want to know if you know, diet diet. Obviously, it's pretty. It, you know, it can affect how you recover from things. It can it can certainly affect bone health. So I really want to know if if there's issues there, which might be the reason why they're not recovering. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of you know high, runners that are running a lot and are pretty into their um, uh, performance might be trying to lose weight leading into a race. Um, and, you know, if they're not doing that in, in a safe way, it might be that might be part of the reason why they're injured or they've got a stress fracture, calorie restriction or, or you know, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, and then so stress, you know, being stressed, stressed or anxious, the sleeping habits. So I know that, yeah, I found that out personally with you know reduced sleep with kids so any runner that comes in with kids i'm going to be pretty um uh, <laughs> out of empathy for them um because you just can't do the same training like i i can't i'm not going to be able to do the same training as i did when i was getting eight hours of sleep and if i do and i have done you know i'll more likely to get to get injured or or, or reach a plateau and not you know, you're either going to get injured or you're not going to perform at your best because you're going to be on that edge of, of overtraining. And so you're not going to, your performance will stagnate or, or you'll get injured or a combination. Oh, but the whole, the whole issue of the, that, that new word sleep hygiene has become a really big issue in the last few years. It's just when you look at the number of meta-analysis systematic reviews on, on sleep and stress fractures, there was one recently on um, yep. sleep and even diabetic foot ulcers. Like the whole huh. sleep issues really become... And, and yeah, you know, like we've always known, eight hours sleep was important, but the, never really thought any more than that about it. And, and now, when you you know, you know when you look at the literature on sleep and and musculoskeletal problems and all sorts of health problems, it's really become a big issue. And sleep yeah. and uh, sleep and sensitivity too. Certain um, yeah. certain below a certain number of hours, and you you generally you rate higher on on vision LVAS pain scales mm. and things as well. So yeah, do you ask about? Um, I, I might be getting ahead of myself because I know we've got another page there. If you've asked about changes in sleeping habits, do you actually ask anywhere how many hours do you get a night? It, yeah, no. Um, probably wouldn't be a bad idea because I know there are some in some of those studies. There are cutoffs where, which say you know you have less than seven hours of sleep, you're at increased risk. Um, yeah. But yeah, yeah, I don't think there's a, there's probably not a magic number as we know. But it's good to know if mm. someone says if someone says four, no matter what, what what paper you read, that's probably not enough, right? So um, yeah, yeah, and just I, change I, as well. Like I think the main thing is if if you know. So, yeah, some people just seem to sort of get by with a certain amount, but if it's certainly if it's changed, um, yeah. then there might be, a, yeah, it increase. I'd say it makes sense. There might be an increased risk if their body's just not getting what it used to get. Yeah. yeah, but that all comes back to what we said earlier on that the importance of rest. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I, yeah, yeah, you know, and, and I never, and yeah. never forget, and I, I've talked about this a lot. Robert D. Costello, he was asked years ago in an interview about why he could run better than his competitors and his answer was he was lazier than them and and <laughs> what he meant was he spent more time lying on the couch watching tv you know he yep. they may have trained as hard as he did but they back in those days they probably had to go and do an eight hour day work um he was unemployed <laughs> so he he was yep. getting more rest even though the training loads were equivalent and I, I think that really hit home to me with that interview that well, actually this probably really is a lot more important than we thought yeah. Oh, you yeah. know, I was. Talk I know Tom knows this already, but I've been doing a lot of reading about running in Kenya and running in Japan. And I know you've done a lot of running in Japan yourself, Tom. Um, and they say the big differences between them: they train just as hard, but the Kenyans rest better um, because of the culture of, of you know, the, the Japanese sort of culture of, of working hard all the time. I don't know if that's your experience, having mm -hmm. done several marathons in Japan as well. But um, yeah, rest is key, right? Yeah. It comes back coming back to our foam rolling. If someone said to me, "I foam roll because it feels good," I say, "Great." And they say, "Yep, I, I get up half an hour early every morning 
and I do half hour of foam rolling. At that point, I probably say, you know what, half hour sleep is probably better recovery than half hour foam rolling. But, um, <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. the best, the best. Rec- so um, then we come into what looks like, I guess we used to call it the female, the, the female athlete triad, but uh, we, should, we call it yeah. red, S, red S now, don't we? But yeah, we're yeah. getting into those kind of um, hormonal and metabolic type questions. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess, yeah. So yeah, it's going to be an indicator, I guess, if they've got, if they've got reds, if they're not having, you know, if they're not having regular periods, they probably don't have the energy availability. It's going to hinder their recovery, their bone health. Um, and yeah, age of first period. So it, it's, you know, it, it can affect their bone health later on. So that might be an interesting sort of thing to, to, to look at, particularly for the, yeah, the females that are coming in with recurrent stress fractures. Um, you know, if, if there's red, if there's things there that I'm, I'm worried about, you know, then I'd probably just refer on to, you know, that they'll probably see their doctor or sports doc and, and look at um, DEXA scans and things like that as well, just to look yeah. at bone health. Yeah. Yeah. yeah cool. Um, um, and I, so that's pretty much it. Is that the last page? Are we got we're done. Yeah. Yep. So oh, you're it. done. Actually, it says you're done. <laughs> yep. <laughs> You just want to stop uh, the share. Uh, yeah. You just do stop, stop share screen, Thomas. You just oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Up now we're finished. Yeah. That's awesome. I mean, what we've essentially got there is, like we say, uh, you know, four. Well, not quite five. Not quite five, but four pages of questions. And once and you've got all of this information before the person's come to see you, you've just got so much information there about the not about the the, the, the anatomy that's injured. You know, that's not our goal. Yeah. We've got information here about the human being, about the about the ecosystem that is the human body and what, how they may be stressing it and not just stressing it from running it. And I, I can't stress enough to anyone watching who doesn't have um, uh, one of these forms specifically for runners to, to by all means, you know, like borrow from this because this is, this is where it should be. A couple of other questions that have come in uh, just, uh, I guess more, they come under the social, social history questions. Do you ask people what they do for a living uh, and therefore get a feel for how much of the day they're sitting on their ass versus not, et cetera? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So my, my standard intake form before this form will have that as well. And then I would normally just ask them verbally what they do as well. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Uh, and there was another one. I scribbled it down. Where was it? Um, we talked about sleep. We talked about things. Oh, Jill. Hi, Jill. I didn't realize you were watching. Jill's just said, um, female history, quite limited. What about endometriosis? So I guess that, you know, um, how, what's your percentage of female runners to male runners that you see? Uh, in clinic uh i haven't done the maths it's probably it it's probably around 50 50 if i was just to ballpark it but i guess you could go in more depth on the female side of things that are in the hour this is all stuff that you're getting yeah before before you see them and then you can dive deeper yeah if if need be Yeah. yeah Yeah. perfect yeah. great um so we asked about what they do for a living there was one more and i've lost it are there any other questions that you've seen no, coming through craig no i didn't know there's a couple of comments but yeah I, I think that we've covered pretty much everything um i mean jeff made a comment earlier on i love it when a new runner takes training advice from a very experienced experienced runner and tries to copy their training routine <laughs> <laughs> you know i think we i know um or, or they or they they yeah no i think this is probably a good good chance to 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 wind it up i'm very conscious of the hour but the whole thing's reminded me of something that was said to me when i was a student by um one of my teachers back then and, and he said always listen to your patient they will tell you the diagnosis and yeah. i think this whole episode sums that up really quite nicely in a way more sophisticated way than what we used to do back when i was a student um but so look, thanks, Thomas. The, the hour has gone really, really quickly. Um, we could always spend a lot more time talking about this. So thanks for, again, getting up so early and coming to join us. No problem. Yeah. Thanks, thanks for having me on. That was brilliant. To summarize for everyone, take a deep history. Um, it helps if you're a runner yourself. Don't always don't have to be as quick as, as Tom, but it helps if you're a runner yourself. Um, and running Coverload. I want that to stick. I want you to reference this episode if it sticks. Um, <laughs> Love it. Okay, thanks everyone. Okay. Thanks guys.